Concerns about money and wealth dominate relationships among nations and national politics, our businesses and our jobs, our families, and even our own internal dialogue. We think a lot about money. And I think there's the potential for any of us to think, well, that's not, you know, that's not, God's not, that, you know, that, that's kind of separate. Um, it's not. Now, we highly esteem the acquisition of wealth. I think that uh, it has to, be, has to be admitted, at least in the United States, and I think it's pretty much global, but we highly esteem the acquisition of wealth. Yet, this thing that we hold so dear, so important, often ends up weighing us down like an unbearable burden. We're either obsessed with how much we have or worried and obsessed about how much we lack. We think about it a lot. Without the wisdom and the perspective that we get from God and from his word, the place and the position of wealth in our lives can get out of balance. And without God and his wisdom and his input, it does get out of balance. Your creator knows that you need money. If you think about it, think about it all, God kind of made money. He made wealth. God gets money. He understands it. He knows you need some wealth. He knows you need some cash in the bank. And he knows that these things, money, wealth, and stuff, are important to you. Because you're wired that way. You know it. I know it. God knows it. He wired you. Actually, God is very interested in money. And very interested in wealth. And very interested in your possessions. And I hope this isn't a surprise to any of us. He has quite a bit to say about it. Quite a bit to say about money and wealth and positions. What he's interested in is how we handle it. God wants all his children to prosper and to work hard and to be content. I could kind of sit down after that because <laughs> that's the message. Prosper, work hard, and be content. I will, however, though, try and fill in some of the blanks or some of the gaps, if you will, put some meat on the bones. <clears throat> and he offers us a lot of guidance to help make that possible. Okay? To help make those things happen. God gives us some advice. With the other matters of life, like, like sex or law, if you want to extend that out, you know, your relationship to authority, or if you're talking about worship, humanity makes a grave and huge error in all these different areas of life. That error is thinking we can handle it alone. Isn't it? You know? I've got this one. You know, you know, I, don't, you know, I, don't, I don't really need God's advice on, on that. You know, I got that one down. You know, I know how to handle money. I just need more of it, right? I got that one down. After all, what does, what does God really know about slugging it out day to day? Trying to make a living. Dealing with the boss. Choking it down sometimes, you know. <clears throat> Trying to make ends meet. Working on a family budget. Balancing a checkbook. What does God know about stuff like that? You know, I got this. I know how to handle this stuff. God knows quite a bit. He created all things. And if you think about it realistically, it's one of the things that the life of Jesus Christ brings to God's revelation to you and to me 
that's really super important because Jesus lived all that stuff. He had a job. I'm pretty sure that after his father died, he had a lot to do with running the household. They had to make ends meet. I don't know if he was self-employed or had a boss or whatever, but until he was 30 years old, he had to deal with all that stuff. So he gets it. He lived it. But humanity does not give God credit for having the answers. We want to figure it out for ourselves. Not only do we not give God credit for knowing it, even if we do give him credit, we still want to figure it out for ourselves. You know, I got this one. And that message and that theme goes all the way back to the very beginning of Scripture. The very first humans that you meet in Scripture. Uh, I hear you, but I'm gonna, I want to try it out my own way. I, I, I want to check things out on my own. Is it not the case? And that is the story of humanity throughout all recorded history. We want to figure out everything on our own. And alas, in doing so, we also cut ourselves off from God's favor and from his advice. In some ways, I suppose we're all cast out of Eden. Today, we're going to review what God's word has to say about financial security and peace of mind. Okay, Financial security and peace of mind. And I have six points. And I'm not, they're not just points. <laughs> action points. I took all the points and I tried to turn them into an action point. All right? Six action points. Um, and we'll go through those. The first one is guard your mind against materialism. Second, remember that the source of all wealth is God. Three, make a conscious decision. What will be your highest priority? Four, fulfill your God-given responsibilities towards others. Five, develop a mindset of contentment. And six, fulfill your personal responsibilities before God. So that's where we're headed. I hope that covers everything. <laughs> I know it won't. <laughs> Guard your mind against materialism. Let's, you know, that's kind of lofty, perhaps a little philosophical. Uh, we will get into some, you know, some things that are fairly um, nitty-gritty, if you want to call it that way. Guard your mind against materialism. As I mentioned earlier, our our brains are wired to understand reality in a certain way. We're physical beings and we're part of a physical creation and we understand things through what? Our senses. We understand things through what we can feel, what we can see, what we can hear, smell, taste, etc. Now we know that there is a spiritual component to life. We know that. Um, if you've been around long enough here, I, I certainly hope that we've passed along that information. There is a spiritual component to all people. But our first instinct is to go with what's material, with what's physical, you know, what we might call real. Things that we can taste, touch, handle, see, and so forth. And I think that is why and perhaps there are other reasons, and I'm, well, actually I know there are other reasons, but that is one of the reasons why God's advice and what God has to offer is hard to swallow because it's oriented toward the development of the spirit. And I think you'll find that all the things that are in these six action points point back in that same direction that the interest God shows in your finances, your financial well-being, and how you handle it is really about your spiritual development. Your spiritual development. Much of what God reveals in his word is actually contrary to human nature. 
mean, human nature goes this way, and what God's got you to want you to think about is going this way. Right? They are contrary in nature. He tells us not to make the accumulation of wealth and goods our top priority. Okay? And all the while, our human nature is, say, it's sitting on the other shoulder screaming, No! <laughs> no! Gather as big a stash as you possibly can. It's your ticket to survival and, and dominance over other people and, and happiness. No! Is that not part of your internal dialogue? Turn with me to Matthew 6, verse 33. That's how the flesh thinks. I, you know, I, I, I suppose I uh, be, ought to be careful. I don't put words in your mouth, but I know that's what, uh, that's what my flesh thinks. Get a big stash, and you are going to be safe, secure, and happy. Matthew 6, verse 33. Where am I? Seek first his kingdom, God's kingdom, and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Now you might ask, well, what all things? What are we talking about? Well, the previous section goes through people's concerns about food, clothing, wealth. Actually, clothing, you might think it's kind of weird because nowadays you know, clothing just seems like a throwaway to us. But back in those days, clothing was a big deal. It was a source of wealth. People wanted clothes. A suit of clothes was a sign of wealth. And people were very concerned about that. They were concerned about their food, their drink. And God says, seek first my kingdom. Focus on the stuff that I want you to focus on. And I will help you out with all that stuff. I will take care of you. I will see to it that you are taken care of. God's telling us that he wants us to make spiritual development or if you will, the building of the mind of Christ in you, that to be your top priority. He wants you to focus on spiritual development, building the mind of Christ, which is necessary for success in the coming rule of God on earth through Christ. Your hope and your goal of participating in a positive way in the coming kingdom is built upon your spiritual development in, in the days that you have in the flesh right now. God wants you to put that first. And there are other reasons for that. We'll get around to that. And he adds to that, saying that if you make this your focus, he will take care of the necessities of life. But that is not a promise. And this is where some folks, we, we all do this, we get it wrong is not a promise of a life of ease and comfort. That's not what God is getting at, a life of ease and comfort. No. Nope. Many aspects of your spiritual development come only through perseverance through trial. God's warning about the wrong mental outlook regarding wealth, money, and stuff is actually one of God's top ten guidelines for living. Go back to Exodus 20, verse 17. This is in the top ten. You might have already thought of it this way. Maybe you haven't. But in Exodus 20, verse 17, there's a commandment that says, You shall not covet. Then it goes on and talks about, you know, things you can covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his, his servants or his donkey or ox or anything that belongs to your neighbor. God's warning about the wrong way of thinking about money and wealth is one of the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments. It deals with this internal dialogue. It's big, big stuff. So not only... Does God have a lot to say about money and wealth and all that stuff? It's very high on the priority list. 
Now, coveting, I understand that it's not just about money. It can also deal with, with sex, status, and stuff like that. But isn't it probably a lot of it about money and wealth and possessions? Covetousness is, uh, this is one of those older words, you know, that we, we sort of have it in our um, vernacular now. But what it means is an intense, perhaps obsessive desire for more. More. And when I've got that, I want more. Covetousness. It could also be, I suppose, defined as wanting to possess uh, or, ha- or not being content with what is legitimately yours. All right? I want to possess yours as well. All right? I got mine, but I would also like to own yours. I'd like to have that as well. That's just, I'm, I don't want to go on and on about covetousness, but think about covetousness. There's many ways you could talk about it. Greed, obsession, focus on wealth. One of the Ten Commandments. Let's see. Let's turn to Hebrews 13, verse 5. If you're reading in the King James, it says covetousness, but I think that the NIV is actually a little closer when you look at the underlying words. But it means the same thing. Hebrews 13, verse 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So that's point number one. Guard your mind against materialism. Number two. Remember that the source of all wealth is God. It's kind of a subset, if you will, of remembering God as our creator. You know, this, the scriptures start right off getting, you know, getting some very important things settled. All right? Like we talk, I just talked about you know, money. It's in the top ten. It's right there at the front of the book. It's in the top ten. Well, acknowledging God as creator is like in the very first chapter. Big, big deal. It, it, it encompasses all things, life and so forth. But as creator, God created all things, all stuff, all the things that we want to gather and consider to be wealth, all the gold and all the wood and lumber we use to build homes, all the land, everything. He created all that. And they are his to freely give to whomever he chooses. For whatever reason he chooses. And it is, you know, something that comes up often in life. We look over at someone else and we think, why did they get to be rich? (laughs) Have you ever seen, who's ever seen uh, Fiddler on the Roof? Uh, It's one of my favorite songs when he sings. He sings a song, If I Were a Rich Man. Who knows that song? I love that song. Ah, Could you not have tested me with making me rich? (laughs) I love that. Psalm 24, verse 1. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. All things belong to God. All things. With that understanding in mind, there are a couple of to-dos, if you will. If you like takeaways and to-dos, here's two. Your first to-do, say thanks. So we want to acknowledge God for his gifts. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is to acknowledge God is to say thank you. And we've had a message just recently about thankfulness, and so that's been covered Say thanks. Well, that's great, you know. Right? Words, words, words. Well, thank you for all that great stuff. The second point is to put your money where your mouth is. That's always important to God. Action, doing, and very tangible things. Put your money where your mouth is. Give back 10% of your increase. This 10% 
give back, or you could call it a rebate or whatever, <laughs> 10% give back to God accomplishes quite a number of things. It takes your thoughts and it puts them into concrete action. You might be thankful. You may say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. But put those thoughts and that thankfulness into concrete action by giving back, by giving back. And this giving back to God also puts you in the position of participating in and supporting the proclamation of his truth to others so that they might learn and that they might benefit. Abraham did it. Jacob did it. All Israel was instructed to do it, to tithe. And Jesus endorsed tithing. Willingness to acknowledge and obey God is the first step towards learning important spiritual lessons through the managing of your personal finances through how you manage your money you begin learning some very top level very important spiritual lessons and it's important to note when talking about tithing and I'm not going to give a whole uh, message on tithing because actually I just did that a couple of months ago God also promises material blessings to those who obey and acknowledge him through tithing. But like I said before, this is not a promise of a life of ease and comfort and riches and wealth. Think of it in terms of what we've read already, where God says, I will take care of you. I will watch out for you. I will see to, the, I will see to it that you don't lack any of the things you need for life. What I want you to do is focus on your spiritual development unto the kingdom of God. So putting God first in your financial plans is a demonstration, if you will, real, you know, something you can do, not just think, but a demonstration of intent and a realignment of your priorities. Turn to Leviticus 27, verse 30. A tithe or a tenth of everything from the land whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. And every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. Uh, I thought that was interesting because it did kind of shows, it kind of <laughs> speaks to our natural human um, instinct, which would be, okay, I got to give them, you know, I got to give them some of the flock. All right, well, I'm going to pick out all the scrawny, grunty little lambs, and I'm going to, you know, I'll give those ones. But no, God even, he's kind of ahead of the parade here, and he says, no, no, every tenth one, that is, as the animals pass beneath the rod of the shepherd, uh, nope, every tenth one. Uh, I know that when we are dealing in a cash-based society, it's not quite that way, but the perspective and the prioritization and the way of looking at it is what's important. The first tenth set aside for God's purpose and not your own. One of the first action steps, or the first to-dos, if you will, in financial security and peace of mind. Point number three Point number three, and again, I'm trying to write this as action points, things you can do. Make a conscious decision. What will be your highest priority? I don't know if you've ever sat back and done one of those uh, bucket lists or, you know, hey, here's the things I'd like to accomplish and do in my life. So you write stuff down and it kind of makes you get this sense of, of um, well, I've got to do this now. I've written it down. Well, that's what I would call a conscious decision. Not just fumbling and bumbling your way through events, but making a conscious decision. And I ask, why not make a conscious decision? What will be your highest priority? What do I mean by that? Well, you probably have already guessed. Let's take a look at Ecclesiastes 2. Ecclesiastes 2. You know, as soon as we go into Ecclesiastes, we're going to start getting deep. <laughs> Philosophical. What is the meaning of everything? <clears throat> and yes, indeed, Ecclesiastes 2 does just that. 
And it gives us some really good perspective. Um, when I was young, yes, I was once young. Some people might still think I'm young. But when I was young, I really liked the book of Ecclesiastes. And I think the reason was because it had all this um, wisdom. And it clearly came from someone who had done a lot of stuff, who'd lived a lot of years, who experienced a lot of things. And as a young person, I knew nothing. <laughs> I'm still kind of, you know, working on that. But I really enjoyed the book of Ecclesiastes because it was like being able to tap into wisdom. Well, it was. I was tapping into wisdom and perspectives that I just simply could not have at a young age. And I'm thinking, you know, when I was about 25 or so. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 1 through 11 says, I said to myself, and this is, this is Solomon, he's the one writing it, and he's done a lot and seen a lot, and he says to himself, Come, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that, but that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guiding with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. So he's kind of going on an experiment, if you will. He's saying, I am just going to look at all these different areas of life where we might be able to find some satisfaction and some sense of accomplishment or whatever. And I think there's a fascinating verse there where he says, I did this all still guided by my wisdom. Almost like he's doing all this stuff and then standing beside himself looking at what's happening. Okay, I'm still kind of an outsider on my own life. I'm wondering, is this, is this going to give me happiness? Is this going to satisfy me? Verse 4, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well. The delights of a man's heart. So he's, he's done it all. He's uh, folly, drinking, um, building projects, sex. I became, verse 9, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. So he's got this self-awareness that he's kind of walking himself through this project, this learning experience. What matters? You know, what really satisfies? Verse 10, I denied myself nothing that my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. So I did all this stuff, and, you know, it was rewarding, and that was it. Okay, Verse 11, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. You've got to read the whole, the whole chapter, the whole book. And I'm not going to do that, but I encourage you to, you know, to take that thought and, and, and run with it. Because he talks about why he came to this conclusion. You know, and really, the, con the, the conclusion is... Because you're going to die. And he realizes this. And he says, all this stuff that I've built, I'm going to die and I'm going to end up leaving it to one of my no good sons. <laughs> Who didn't do anything to create it and probably doesn't really appreciate it or care. Just takes it all for granted. And he says, it was meaningless. Meaningless. Okay, so we're in, uh, ooh, did something there. Ecclesiastes, so let's turn to chapter 5. Verse 10, he says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. It just fails to satisfy. It fails to satisfy. And, you know, like I mentioned, at some point you realize that you're going to have to leave it all behind. And some people try you know, different weird ways to 
see if they can take it all with them. You know, they try and see if they can be cryogenically frozen or something like that and be awoken in the future or have their brain downloaded into some database somewhere. And, but you can't take it with you. I, I hope that you've all thought about that some in your life. And as I mentioned, worse than that, you build all this stuff and you achieve all this and you leave it behind someday. And the people who take it over, you don't know what they're going to do with it. You don't know what they think about it or what they care. They don't. Sometimes they do good with it. Most times they don't. Let's turn to Matthew 6, verse 24. Let's get to what Jesus himself wanted to say on the matter. Who actually talked quite a bit about money, Jesus. Because he wants us to think it through, have a good perspective, and not get caught up in things. In Matthew 6, verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. Okay? Nobody can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then he you know, says it again. You cannot serve both God and money. Okay? You cannot serve both God and money. And this comes after a section where he talks about priorities and storing up treasures in heaven, which really means your spirit, your character. Okay? Now, you might think, you might think that you'll be able to give equal focus to both God and the pursuit of wealth. You know, I can manage this. Woohoo! And I can juggle it all, and I can manage it all, and I can, I can have an equal focus on God and money. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna fall through the cracks on this one. No way. But you can't have two top priorities, can you? How is it even possible? It's either a top priority or it's second, isn't it? By definition, you can't have two top priorities. If you think of you know, it all as a pyramid, something's going to be at the top. right? So you have to make a conscious decision. What is going to be at the top? What is at the top of your pyramid? Riches. That's one of the options. That might be at the top of your pyramid. And again, God acknowledges that you need money. He knows that you need money to survive, and he promises to help, okay? But it, it can seem a lot more sound and secure to rely on a hoard of cash or lots of property or you know, a stash of precious metals under your bed somewhere. Think, well, this, <laughs> I can really count on this stuff. The push comes to shove. I want cash, right? And if you, if you confess to yourself, let's let the little ones come in here. <laughs> Sounds like they were having a good time back there, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so anyway, it just can seem a lot more um, sound and secure to rely on cash and property and owning an extra home and just having, you know, good stuff to fall back on. And, um, you know, it's because we can see those things. If we can touch them, we can feel them. You can, you know, you can be like, you know, Scrooge McDuck and you can dive into your pile of money and you can count it and feel it and touch it and know that it's all there. And look, they do have they do have some power to keep us from trouble. That is, you'd be a fool to deny that, and God's word doesn't deny it either. God's word does not deny the fact that having, some, having a little stash of cash is good to keep you out of trouble. But there are some difficulties that, no matter how much you've got, it can't deliver you from them. Um, a couple, the death of a child... All the money in the world isn't going to fix that. A divorce, losing your marriage. All the money in the world 
do nothing, won't fix it at all. So perspective, perspective is important. Well, those are just two that I came up with, two that strike me as particularly poignant and sad. The weakness of riches is that they are vulnerable. We're in Matthew um, 6, in verse 19, he says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin can destroy, where thieves break in and steal. And then he goes on and says, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not steal and break in. For where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And again, this harkens back to, in those days, they looked at wealth as certain types of things. Clothing was actually a big part of a person's wealth. And again, it's, it's one of those things that's lost in translation. But back then, your wardrobe was huge, and it was a huge symbol and source of your wealth. People didn't have, they didn't have banks back then, if you think about it. And they had to kind of store their wealth in stuff they had, homes, uh, but clothing was one that they could you know, move around quite easily. And so the word picture that Jesus is working on there is, well, so you've got all these clothes, but you, know, you put it in the closet and the moths get in there. And <laughs> Riches are vulnerable. Riches are vulnerable. Even today when we, you know, we don't have, you know, I don't put any value in this or my tie. I could care less. They're not worth much. After I bought them and worn them, they're almost worthless. <laughs> You know, I can, take them to the, I can take them to the Salvation Army, and that's about it. But riches are vulnerable. Let's, uh, let's say they can suddenly be taken away from you. How? A stock market crash. Foof. Um, a flood, or a storm, or a fire if you don't have insurance. And the day of your own death. I was thinking about a, an example of that, and there's lots. Steve Jobs came to mind. Do you know who Steve Jobs is? Steve Jobs? Surprised. I only saw one hand. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So Steve Jobs, think of it. What a guy. What a life. He, he did so much, right? He accomplished so much. And he made a ton of money, too. And he, he really made an impression on this world that we live in, okay? And now he's dead. He died of cancer a few years ago. I think he was about 60 when he died. So he didn't have a long life. Late 50s, maybe? He wasn't, he wasn't old. No? I'm not that far off, though. Yeah. Um, you know, decent, decent life, but he died. Okay. Well... There's a, you know, there's a movie about Steve Jobs and there's a book. What do you think about Steve Jobs in, say, 30 years? Think anybody's going to really care that much? No, he'll be, he'll be there in the encyclopedia next to the guy who invented peanut butter. Right? Which was a tremendous invention. <laughs> peanut butter. That changed the world. Right? It did. I love peanut butter. But Steve Jobs, one day, you know, he's going to appear before his creator and God will say, okay, Steve, sit down, let's talk. So about your life, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. What's he going to say? I invented the iPhone. Okay, okay. So, all right, well, take a seat over there next to the peanut butter guy. It just won't be the biggest deal in town. But it was a tremendous accomplishment and a tremendous achievement in life. But what is it in the eyes of God? We will see. Luke 12. I don't mean Luke 12 is going to show us. I just, <laughs> moving on. Luke 12, verse 15 through 21. Two people come up to Jesus and they start saying, Hey, you know what? You're the judge. I want you to decide this case between me and my brother. We've got a financial dispute. And Jesus says, no, no. That's not what I'm here for. That's not what I do. Verse 14, actually verse 15, he says, Then he said to them, watch out and be on guard against all kinds of greed. You guys are fighting brother against brother, you know, hands around each other's throat about money. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded 
an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, hmm, what do I do? I have no place to store my crops. So he had more than he could possibly use, more than enough. And he said, oh, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? For yourself. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Now let's see. Drop down to verse 32 through 34. He says... These are all red letters. So he goes on with a, quite a significant section of teaching here. And later on, he says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide your, for yourselves what will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So riches, and it's one of the things that could be at the top of your pyramid, your top priority. But a rich person's wealth and accomplishments die with them. Unless they are accomplishments unto God's end and God's purpose. Which if you hearken back to what was mentioned before is spiritual development. But a rich person, all that stuff is gone. And it's disappeared. So the other thing that could be at the top of your pyramid is serving God, right? Remember we, got, we, we had those two options, two masters. You can't serve both. You've got to pick one, God or money. Well, what about God, serving God? If you put your primary focus on building the mind of Christ in you, then what, what the scriptures are telling you that you are investing in something that will never be taken away, cannot be taken away won't be taken away even on the day you die you will be investing in something that goes beyond all that and it is there waiting for you on the day of resurrection take a guy Bob Honeycutt gone dead awaiting his resurrection but all that he has invested in himself if you will unto God his spiritual development and that is all waiting for him. He had a nice house though. He had a nice house and some beautiful furniture, some beautiful clothes. It's all gone. It means nothing to him now. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 12 through 15. If anyone builds on this foundation, which is Jesus Christ, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, Wood, hay, straw. Their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though as one escaping through the flames. The one who builds with precious metals and gold, those things will survive the fire. Those are the quality things. Those are the spiritual developments that you put into building the mind of Christ. The wood, the hay, the straw, those are all going to be burned up. Now, straw is good, hay is good, wood is good, but they will be burned up. Um, I mean, I, I really don't want to try and ridicule Steve Jobs. He's a tremendous guy. My point is, you know, he did all that great stuff, you know, and, but now it's gone. Now, if he used those things to build the mind of Christ, and I don't, you know, I really don't know the man's relationship with God at all. Well, that's a good thing. That's something that, you know, he has to look forward to. I mean, I've read a bit about the guy. I don't think that's where he was coming from, but, you know, all those things are burned up. They're gone. Matthew 13, verse 22, if you would. I'm still on the point about 
your top priority here? Pick one, you know, God or money. In Matthew 13, verse 22, this is from the parable of the sower. And I hope you all know the parable, okay? One of the scenarios is the seed falls on a certain type of ground. Verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. Warning from God's word. If you do try to have it both ways, God's warning is money will probably end up choking out its rival. That's your warning from God, your creator. If you try and have it both ways, money chokes out godliness. I didn't make it up. That's just the way God presents it to us. Be careful. Be on, on guard. Okay, the next point. Which was that? Am I on point three or four? <laughs> four? Okay. Fulfill your God-given financial responsibilities towards others. Okay, now getting to you know, some of the very practical stuff. Fulfill your God-given financial responsibilities towards others. First one, pay your taxes. Pay your taxes. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. We live in a society not so different from the bad old days. They had to pay taxes back then too. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Let everyone, this is to the church, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you'll be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do bear the sword, do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment upon the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of punishment, but also matters of conscience. Verse 6. This is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. It's actually something, I don't know how long, you know, you've been a part of the church, but <laughs> over the years, I have come across many, many people who have tried to prove to me from scriptures that they don't need to pay taxes. Yeah, you shake your head. No, seriously. Um, yeah, you know, it's part of freedom, and they'll go back into the Constitution and stuff like that, and they'll say, well, I, I, God doesn't want me to pay taxes. It's wrong. It's stealing. It's a form of theft. I've heard all kinds of you know, theories about it. You are instructed to pay your taxes. Does that mean that the church is saying that all taxes are good and what they spend it on is good? Absolutely not. I hate what happens to my tax money. I hate it. Let's see, where are we? Matthew 22. And I'm sure that the, you know, back in the Roman Empire, they spent their taxes on, I know they spent their taxes on building palaces for themselves and just horrible stuff. That's just, that's benign compared to some of the stuff they were up to. Uh, let's see, Matthew 22, verses 17 through 21. Um... They're trying to corner Jesus and they say, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right for a person to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? These were Jews and they were used, trying to use scripture to say they didn't need to pay taxes to, G to Caesar. That's kind of the backdrop for what, what's going on here. They felt that you know, they, they should pay to the state when the state was you know, the priesthood and all that. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. And they brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's. And then they were amazed. So you pay your taxes, but you don't neglect God. That's what he's saying there. Okay? 
Your God-given responsibilities towards others also include being generous and willing to contribute to the needs of others. Okay? <laughs> Covering a lot of ground there. Second <laughs> uh, Corinthians. Second Corinthians nine, verse sixteen through or sorry, six through fifteen. Uh, let's see. Remember this, O Corinthians. And it's to us as well. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things and at all times you have all that you need, and you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Very important point, verse 11. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. They were going to carry this offering to a different church area. This service that you performed is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also, is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks toward God. Because of the service by which you have pr proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his incredible gift. That's talking about the collection for the Jerusalem church, which was suffering famine. The people in Corinth put together this, you know, food drive or money drive, probably money. And they did this stuff. Most, I mean, God wants us to take care of other people. And if you think back, verse 11, we'll touch on this again. Ephesians 4, verse 28. God's work ethic. Why does God want you to work hard? Well, there's a number of different reasons. Ephesians 4 verse 28 says, Anyone who has been stealing must no longer steal, but must work doing something useful with their own hands so that they may have something to share with those in need. So God's blessing in, in the previous verse in, in um, was it Matthew? Yeah, no, Second Corinthians. And then here it says, God has a rationale for the work ethic. Why does God want people to work hard? Well, we, we tend to think of money as a way of satisfying our personal needs and wants. Therefore, money is sort of a, my, a me thing, if you will. But in God's eyes, money is just one of life's many temporary experiences we can use to build godly thinking. Okay? And in, and in this case, in both those cases, not only to take care of our own needs, but to have extra to help others in need. Okay, next point, point five. Develop a mindset of contentment. Philippians 4. Mindset of contentment. <clears throat> Philippians 4, verses 10 through 13. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no, no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to be plenty in plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul is presenting contentment as um, a form of mental discipline. Right? Discipline your minds. Part of putting on the mind of Christ is contentment. Focus on your genuine needs rather than all the flashy stuff that's out there. And there's lots of it. You know, you go on Facebook and you see people, you know, they're having fun and they're on a yacht and they're taking a trip and you think, man, I want that stuff too. 
or you watch ads, you know, on TV and the ads, you know, they're trying to tell you, you need this stuff. All right? But contentment, it's a mental discipline. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 12. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we have brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There is great spiritual danger in always wanting more. Harken back to the commandment. Don't covet. It's bad for you to covet. Last point. Fulfill your personal responsibilities before God. Contentment does not mean laziness. Very important point. It does not mean laziness. God's plan and purpose for you involves working hard, being self-sufficient and not taking advantage of others. The mandate for generosity in God's church is not that we create a haven for freeloaders. It is to create an environment, an environment where people are given a way to get back on their own two feet and start becoming a productive person themselves so that they can repeat the process for someone else who needs it. That's what the scriptures that we read were talking about. That's God's way. 1 Thessalonians 4. Verses 11 and 12. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business and work with your own hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will be, not be dependent on anyone. 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 7 through 13. Oops. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. This is Paul's example. We were not idle when we were with you. We did not eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we did not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. Because those people needed to learn about stuff like this. It's a social situation. I've gone into it in the past, but Paul did this to model the right way of living for them. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Two more scriptures. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. Families should take care of themselves. Take care of your own. 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Chapter 6, verses 17 and 19. One more admonition to share our blessings with those who are in need. 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Money is neutral. Neither intrinsically good or bad. Neutral. Okay? Love of money, pursuit of wealth, Greed, covetousness, that's what's bad. And if we have the wrong mental outlook on money, we can be guilty of covetousness and idolatry. 
There's two commandments. If we have the right mental focus, it can be a wonderful vehicle for us to learn important spiritual lessons and, pro- and practice godlike patterns of thinking. And that's what lasts after that burning fire you know, in 1 Corinthians 3. That's what lasts. Money is merely a tool. That's how God sees it from what I can read. Money is a tool. Our challenge is to establish our priorities and practice the financial principles pleasing to God.